Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, July 13th. Brought to you by Vunabaka.com, a new surf and water-based residential community in the island of Fiji. First up, we take a look at the current North Pacific significant wave height charts. As you can see, nothing's really going on. We'll put this in motion real quick, just run it through the loop. Tropical system forecast to make its way into the Philippines about midweek. Another low pressure system of tropical origins trying to develop in the western gulf but then doesn't make it and that's pretty much it. Things wrap up for the week. Next our focus shifts to the South Pacific. Currently a mid-level cutoff low is developing south of Tahiti. 33 foot seas pretty much aimed more Antarctica than anywhere but uh, a little bit of energy pushing towards uh, the Chile area and actually seas from a previous low in the same area also progressing towards Chile. But otherwise, this big area here suggests a major ridge in the upper atmosphere pushing most activity into Antarctic ice and pretty much rendering uh, nil any uh, wave generation activity pushing towards the northern hemisphere. Let's go take a look at the details. First up, we'll take a look at jet stream level winds. These are winds up at 30,000 feet. They help uh, promote the formation of gales and or storms and also direct their paths when they do form. Currently, the pattern is fully split jet stream. Northern branch running about on the 30 south line due uh, west-east zonal flow. Same thing for the southern branch, and this is the branch we really want to look at to uh, uh, look for storm development that will make uh, waves and swell pushing up into our forecast area. It's dis displaced well to the south, down around 68 or so south, and effectively running over Antarctic ice. No troughs pushing north anywhere other than this little little bump here, and even that is nothing of any real interest. Let's put this in motion, see what's scheduled to happen over the next week. Roll it out, and the reality is another Here's a, a ridge, even stronger wind energy pushing south, further south than the previous ridge. Get a little bit of a trough starting to develop on about Wednesday over in the far southeast Pacific. This could help promote gale development, and it does make it north of about the 65 degree line, which is where Antarctic ice is right now. So that would suggest maybe some sort of a gale in this region, probably targeting Chile. But the, the main area we're real interested in, this area here, nothing going on, all winds almost pushing southeast, and that just suppresses gale development. We roll that out a little bit further. And then we start seeing a trough develop on Saturday up into the Tasman Sea. And this is good. I mean, th this is good for at least the Fiji area and New Zealand. Get a little activity in there. It's kind of a cutoff trough. Notice it doesn't last very long, and instantly winds start bridging the gap here. But there was a push up that way, which is a start, and then that's pretty much it. But notice this, still another trough with wind energy, 130 knots, starting to develop under New Zealand on about Sunday the, uh, the 20th or so. So maybe that gives us some hope that this ridging pattern that's been just locked down under New Zealand for several weeks now will start to break up and we'll start to see some uh, storm activity in this corridor over here. No guarantees. Don't want to believe the model a week out, but at least it's a, a hint of a glimmer of hope. Next, let's take a look at surface level pressure, surface level winds. Surface winds are what generate seas, that is roughness on the ocean surface. And when those seas build to high enough proportions and to start radiate away from the fetch or the wind that generates them, that is swell and that's what creates surf. Currently, cut off low, rather large low, actually two lows, one right off Chile, one south of Tahiti. Uh, we'll talk first about this one off Chile. This actually was over here a couple days ago. Had some decent 28-foot oh, seas, almost 30-foot seas, progressed to the east uh, um, and is making swell bound for Chile. Nothing dramatic, nothing super size at all, but surf nonetheless. And here's yet another system. This one is not expected to make it as far to the east, but there is, a, you notice, there's fetch aimed back at New Zealand, that shame sort of southeast, but virtually nothing up to the north. No swell for Hawaii, no swell for California expected from this. It's mainly going to be focused in this region over here. Let's put this into motion, see what happens. As expected, this system makes it to the east some and then starts falling apart. The system down below it here, we'll go back and look, 
That's, for the most part, right on the edge of the ice line, 65. Not a whole lot expected from that. Put that back into motion. And then yet another system forms on Tuesday evening. And we get 45 knot winds, 40 to 45 knot winds here, and lifting north of that 65 degree line. So this is, again, uh, potential swell energy. But just looking at the travel path here, it looks like it's going to be confined to Peru and Chile, that area. Maybe some sideband energy radiating up into California, but not large in size. Uh, High pressure pretty much locking down the mid-latitudes. Again, that's the result of... The, the split jet the f- and, and zonal flow this way, this way as we saw in the previous image, supports high pressure in between the, t- the split flows. And then here we go. Oops, let's go back a little bit. Look right in this region. Here we, we notice a trough building late in the week in the Tasman Sea. And sure enough, that helps support 30, 35 knot winds. Fiji is right in this area here. So we'll roll that out. Notice all that fetch pushing right up into here. And some of that, for that matter, is in the California swell window and Hawaii, for that matter, too. And this sort of continues on right through, um, so into 180 hours out. So there's some potential there. And look at this, another gale developing. Notice there was a bit of a, of a trough starting to form here on the 180-hour uh, jet stream uh, model. So maybe just maybe there's some hope here low pressure starting to build in the area so that's that's a good sign and yet a little bit more fetch over here probably targeting um, Peru and Chile again let's go take a look at the wave model charts next we take a look at significant wave height charts for the South Pacific and we're going back in time almost a week Sunday July 6 low pressure developing east of New Zealand let's put this into motion notice we get 30-foot seas into Monday evening, and let's take a look at the Great Circle Paths here. Relative to Northern California, 210, and if you could zoom in on this area, you'd see it's just barely clear of the shadow. Southern California, uh, 213, and again, barely clear of the shadow, and Hawaii certainly clear, but uh, and aimed well up the 188-degree path to Hawaii. We put this into motion. It notice it pushed this fetch area, 30 foot seas, now 28 foot seas into Tuesday, pushing well to the north. Let's go back and take a look at that. And we'll, t- we'll take a look at it in regard to Southern California. But notice it just pushes right up this angle here, right directly there. And let's do it relative to Hawaii. Not, not so much at Hawaii, but still really good. So what that means is, most of the swell is going to be tra- uh, be generated and pushing in the direction the storm was traveling. So Hawaii, California are good targets. Let's take a look just for fun. Costa Rica, not so much. Um, and actually, there's great circle paths that go north of this. This is really just focused on the more southern routes. Um, so the focus, though, is going to be this area here over to Hawaii. Um, and that swell is expected in later this week for uh, continental U.S. Anyway, roll this out and we'll get through. Nothing really happened after that. We'll actually go back one more. The small system then, the remnants of that system redeveloped south of Tahiti. And 30-foot seas, 28-foot seas. Again, this is the one targeting Chile and Peru and rolling towards the coast and now we're approaching current another system right behind that this drove the southern oscillation index negative relative to tahiti difference in pressure between darwin and tahiti so that's good news that sort of suggests an el nino like pattern we won't go and say it's el nino though and anyway so we're into we're into sunday now notice this all fell relatively southeast again put that into motion watch that okay see Southeast, not pushing north, nothing expected from this for Hawaii or U.S. West Coast, really confined to these areas here. And now we're into current time, okay, starting here. This system continues to fall southeast and kind of dissipates out, and that's the end of that. And notice this sort of blocking pattern that develops in this area. Not a whole lot going on. That's the ridge. But then first, a little system pushing towards uh, Chile. 
and then a broader area develops. We're into 132 hours out. Notice you can just see the, 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 the ridge in the jet stream pushing south. Energy building here, though, pushing up into the Tasman Sea starting, we'll go back, uh, Friday. And not much, 20, 22-foot seas. That's 13-second period swell into Fiji and probably not a whole lot for Hawaii. Bigger system behind it. Uh, Again, only in the 22-foot C range, not a whole lot going on. And there you are, you're at the end of the chart. So a little bit of activity here, main focus Fiji, secondary Hawaii, maybe some activity over here targeting Chile and Peru. And the, mo the wave models don't pick up on it because the fetch is new, but maybe a little gap here and maybe a little development relative to the greater Pac North Pacific Basin if low pressure and a gale develops here as is suggested by the models. Let's go take a look at the long-term uh, indicators now. First up, Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia and Tahiti. Negative numbers represent at least the active phase of the MJO. Prolonged negative numbers suggest El Nino. At this point in time we had a good little run little spurt of suggestive of the active phase of the MJO. What it really is is those low pressure systems that we saw in previous charts pushing south of Tahiti, pushing the numbers negative. Now we had kind of a neutral pattern and now it's going negative again. There's more low pressure scheduled for Tahiti so we wouldn't be surprised to see these numbers drop off again, which is good. Uh, the 30 day running average uh, basically neutral. We were pretty high there for a while when we were in the uh, mid-June time frame. Things look like they're making a bit of a turnaround, but just neutral, nothing significant. If it was minus 10 or minus 15, then we'd start really getting interested. The 90-day running average, again, suggests purely no neutral. So no, no signs in the SOI of El Nino having an effect on the atmosphere, at least not yet. Next, we take a look at wind anomalies at the 850 millibar level. This is up about 4,500 feet, but is a pretty good indicator of what's going on at the surface. Right now, maybe just the faintest hint of westerly anomalies that would suggest maybe the active phase of the MJO, nothing more, not enough to get a westerly wind burst going, not enough to promote Kelvin wave development. We're in the West Pacific here too, there's Australia. Philippines uh, dateline is here. So pretty much a neutral pattern. We continue on east. This is current weak east, an east anomalies here south of Hawaii and then pretty much neutral on into the Galapagos. Let's go take a look a week out. A week from now, again, West Pacific, maybe the faintest hint of weak east anomalies, but uh, almost a, just a neutral pattern. And then we get into the uh, the East Pacific, and again, pretty much neutral, nothing one way or the other going on. The models had actually suggested a pretty good bout of easterly anomalies um, about midweek, um, but it appears this model is suggesting that that might not be the case now, which would be good news. And here's the longer range models. This is outgoing long wave radiation. The blues suggest the active phase of the MJO and one would assume westerly anomalies with that. Uh, this is a uh, two week window. This is the, the statistic model. It suggests basically we're in the active phase and it's supposed to hold and then sort of weaken about two weeks out, which is a lot better. A month ago we were looking at the models this was all supposed to be the inactive phase of the MJO and easterly anomalies, so things have really done a turnaround. July is a critical month. We would want to see, at a minimum, a neutral phase, if not uh, westerly winds. This is reasonably suggest suggestive of that. We take a look at the GEFS, which is basically the GFS model ensemble version. It's not as aggressive regarding the MJO, the active phase. It says it's just going to dissipate out and turn neutral. But if El Nino were in play, that's exactly what you would expect would be pure neutral, not a whole lot going on, or if anything, weakly active, certainly not inactive. So we're in a better place than we were per the models a couple of weeks ago, but still there, there's no real signs of westerly anomalies that we, we've been able to see so far. Let's dig a little deeper. The 40-day upper level model. Green suggests areas uh, of enhanced precipitation and the active phase of the MJO, yellows, reds, oranges, 
the inactive phase and high pressure and decreased odds for precipitation. So here we are in July, mid-July, suggests the active phase working its way into uh, Central America by about the beginning of August, which is good news. And then it suggests this rather strong inactive phase developing. We had this sort of a pattern here inactive suggested by this very model the whole way through the month of July. It never materialized. Instead, what we get is a weak active. Um, we're not going to fret about this too much. Uh, we've lost uh, enough night's sleep worrying about whether this is really going to happen. Uh, and it, it's become clear during an El Nino situation, the models just don't have a grasp on what's really going on. But it's a guideline, something to keep in mind. Next, we take a look at surface level uh, or sea surface temperature anomalies, deviations from normal, large pool, warm water developing off the Galapagos in between there and Ecuador, and then drifting off to the west. Um, pretty impressive at this point in time, looks solid. One would think that's an El Nino-like pattern, and definitely it looks like it at the moment. But let's go put this into motion and sort of see what's happening in, over time. Let's go back to June, warm water over the dateline, Warm water over the Galapagos, streaming towards the dateline, complete solid warm water in this area, and the Kelvin wave, the big Kelvin wave that was generated in January, February, and March from westerly wind bursts in this area was on the verge of erupting in this area. Let's put it into motion. See warm water building there into June, early July, and now notice this. It's breaking up here. There's starting to be pockets of cooler water, not really cooler, but not the continuous coverage that there was. We'll put that back. Notice how it was fully filled in there. And this was really warm in this area, but as we put it into motion, into now, the coverage is starting to get spottier here and here as well. The suggestion being is that the Kelvin wave has hit, it has erupted, it's basically done everything it's going to do, and now it's in decline. And the expectation is water temperatures in this area will start falling because there have been no westerly wind bursts in, in uh, June and even in late May, and there's no warm water in the pipe to recharge or reinforce the warm pool. So what's going to happen is the trades will blow here. Even though they're lighter than normal, they'll still blow. They'll push the warm water off this way, but this area will start cooling down. We'd actually expect to see water temperatures rise here. The, Ni the, the classic Nino ridge is Nino 3.4, which is bound by this area right in here. And what you're actually seeing is water temperatures decreasing there, not increasing. All the activity has been confined to the Nino 1.2 region, which is right in here. Um, so the issue is, will these w warm waters, or have they had been here long enough to have an impact on the atmosphere, will they influence the in atmosphere enough to set us into El Nino? But even bigger concern is if there is no more warm water in the pipe and these waters actually start to cool off, will the atmosphere then re also react in kind and become less El Nino-like? Let's go dig into some of the data. Sea surface temperature, actual temperatures, the date lines here, Galapagos Islands roughly here, Anomalies, differences from normal. We have one to almost one and a half degree anomalies here uh, in the Nino 1.2 region and one degree anomalies pushing into the Nino 3 region. But notice here, this is normal temperatures down here and they are in fact starting to encroach upon the dateline region. Um, Another interesting point, we're looking, these are, this is from the TAO buoy array, actual surface winds on the ocean surface. We have some westerly anomalies here. They were actually stronger um, a couple days ago, suggestive that there was a, I wouldn't call it a westerly wind burst, but enough of uh, westerly winds for about since sometime in late June, oh, about June 28th it started, if I recall. Um, that would set up perhaps a mini Kelvin wave, but... It takes three months for whatever's generated here to get over here, traveling under the ocean surface. Or let's say it started on uh, um, July 1st. It wouldn't get over here until October. Okay, That's a couple of months allowing these waters to dissipate if there's no reinforcements. Let's go take a look at one other surface 
level image. This is high res sea surface temperature anomalies, deviations from normal. One thing we've been watching is this little area here of cooler than normal anomalies right along the coast of Peru. It actually was working itself much further off the coast, looking more robust. It has backed off. Um, these pockets of this would be two and a half to four degree anomalies have decreased in coverage compared to the previous weeks. Actually, this one particular image just today shows a one small pocket of four degree anomalies. These haven't been in place for probably two weeks now, but one little pocket there. But overall, the extent of the coverage of the warm water has definitely gone down from what it was. The peak of the warming was probably in late June when the, Kel when the Kelvin wave from the westerly wind bursts in January, February, March, they showed up in June and it peaked out somewhere about mid to late June. And as expected, it's on the decline now. The, if this were a real El Nino, there should be more Kelvin wave, you know, another Kelvin wave coming in right behind to reinforce this warm pool. Um, we'll take a look at that in a minute. But again, the extent of the warm anomalies here are not as large as they have been in the past. Next, subsurface temperature anomalies. These are actual water temperatures. This is the subsurface profile, deviations from normal. The date lines right here, Galapagos over here. This is the remnants of our Kelvin wave. It had water temperatures five, almost pushing six degrees at one point in, in the June-ish time frame, but notice it is really atrophied now. Three degree anomalies, maybe three and a half right here. It's good hard data. There's sensors here that are depict, uh, showing this, but it's clearly on the dec decline and dropping off almost with every single run. The one glimmer of hope is notice that zero degree anomalies continue the whole way past the date line there is no cutoff of the flow so the deal is you get west winds here they create a kelvin wave in this area warm anomalies that then travel un under the surface of the ocean and then eventually reach the galapagos islands bubble up on the surface and then create warm surface anomalies what we see now is a coherent one degree anomaly here suggestive that in fact a kelvin wave has been generated a very weak one at that from the westerly anomalies that occurred in the uh, late June, early July time frame. This was not a big westerly wind burst event at all. It was pretty minimal, and the Kelvin wave, as it's depicted here, pretty much shows that. Still, three months to get from here to here won't make that till uh, late September, probably. The question is, will this hold on and continue to gurgle up and, and keep some sort of warmth going over the Galapagos so that this can come in, this next Kelvin wave can come in and reinforce it or at least keep it going? The hope is yes. The reality is probably not. We would expect surface temperatures to probably start dropping off pretty severely starting the August time frame. Um, but again, that's just a guess. If there's been this continuous just bleeding light westerly flow, maybe this will actually hold on. It's kind of a crapshoot, but um, we're, we'll hope for the best, but we're not going to count on it. Another view of the same thing. Here's your warm anomalies in the east. Here's your new developing Kelvin wave here. There's a little bit of a gap. This is the June gap when there was no westerly anomalies. Um, but looks, eh, and it, Compared to the previous three years, this is as good as it gets. You got to take what you can get. You can't get too, you can't be asking for too much, though there was discussion of some super El Nino developing. Clearly, this data suggests that that is not going to happen. The best we'll see out of this is probably a, a weak El Nino. And one more bit of data, uh, sea height anomalies. Uh, positive anomalies, 5 centimeters or more, preferably 10, suggest a large Kelvin wave. Notice there's nothing going on here. And here's the remnants of the Kelvin wave that is bleeding out over the Galapagos. Barely 5 degree centimeter anomalies, suggesting there's not a whole lot of wa warm water under here. All the, This just confirms what we've been seeing everywhere else. Um, but this sort of suggests that maybe something is going on on the dateline again. So that is good news. But again, the issue is it's just going to take a while for it to get over here. And finally, the latest forecast from the CFS version 2 Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature anomaly forecast 
has definitely scaled back. At one point, it was up to 1.75 degree anomalies in the winter, fall time frame, then down to 1.45. Now we're looking at about 1.15 degree anomalies and not really, not even tripping over the one degree mark until October. Um, this, so the, uh, the 90, uh, the 2009-2010 El Nino was a 1.4 average degree uh, Nino 3.4 uh, anomaly. This one would be even weaker than that. So we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, I'm very modest. And we suspect this model is probably on the high side of the forecast. The reality is probably come, come in at about a 0.75 or so. Anyway, so not really great news, but you know what? It isn't La Nina. The forecasts are still suggesting some sort of El Nino, probably just a very weak one. We'll take that. We'll take neutral over La Nina any day of the week. So to wrap things up, for the immediate future, small southern hemi swell for the California region late in the week, Hawaii maybe midweek. Um, other than that, El Nino still trying to get going not particularly well organized, not particularly strong looking. Another Kelvin wave in the pipe, small, but at least it's something. It's all a step in the right direction. And we'd like to thank our sponsor, Vunabaka.com, the new residential community in the island of Fiji. Check out the website at Vunabaka.com. We'll do this forecast again next week, same time, same channel. In the meantime, go get some surf, have some fun. Thanks. <laughs>